hello uh, everyone uh, i welcome you all to my uh, presentation my name is mujtaba hassan and i'm from esat uh, deepan b campus and today the topic of my presentation is uh, a systematic exploration of uh, evolutionary computation for the design of hardware oriented non cryptographic hash functions so in this presentation i will be uh, discussing uh, the following things so uh, the amount of internet traffic has ever been increasing now more and more people are using uh, 4k uh, video streaming services online shopping uh, <clears throat> and things like that so uh, uh, even while i'm talking to you uh, about 20 25 uh, terabytes of data has been generated so uh, this has put increased pressure on in, uh, internet service providers and so they are finding uh, uh, new solutions and increasing the speed of bandwidth of uh, high speed eth ethernet solutions and and they are even striving for uh, to achieve 3.2 uh, terabits per second by the year 2030 so uh, um, so with the uh, growth of uh, online world uh, the cyber criminal activities have also seen a sharp rise recently uh, google reported a distributed denial of service attack uh, comprising of 46 millions per second so in our, in order to counter these and uh, other kind of threats uh, network security engineers and researchers uh, they uh, have uh, certain tools uh, in their uh, inventory and uh, intrusion detection system is uh, one of such tools so uh, <clears throat> in this research uh, the application for our work is uh, detection of uh, large flow of uh, data for uh, uh, dis uh, denial of distributed denial of service attacks so what is basically flow uh, a flow uh, consists of uh, all packets that have the same flow id uh, makes a one flow so typically it has a source ip destination ip source port and destination port for ip version 6 packets and it can be modeled with 96 bits or it can be any other combination as well so uh, network intrusion uh, can be detected uh, if it flow exceeds certain uh, threshold so what happens is that when the flow network packet comes in its flow id is extracted and then it is looked up in some kind of uh, blacklist if it is there so it is dropped otherwise its count is increases incre uh, incremented and then this count is again checked against some threshold and if it is there it exceeds the threshold then it is put back in the blacklist otherwise it's allowed so uh, both of these uh, Uh, lookup parts and this counting parts uh, they can be implemented with the help of exact data structures for example cams or arrays or they can be implemented with the help of probabilistic data structures for example uh, bloom filters uh, sketches so what's the difference between probabilistic and exact data structures as the name tells you that exact data structures they are very accurate they don't have any false positive false negative and uh, but the problem is that they store original values and that's why they are not space efficient uh, also they are not scalable because of the same thing uh, on the other hand probability probabilistic data structures uh, they do not store original values so they are very fast they are super space efficient and scalable uh, and they have no false negatives as well but there is a caveat uh, they are not accurate always so they will tell you that uh, okay i am 99.99% sure that this value might be in the list but there is a small chance of error in it for example i i've give you an example of uh, facebook so uh, some years back facebook used to have this bloom filter in it so when you create a user id so it uh, uh, quickly tells you that uh, the name is taken so but uh, imagine how many uh, users facebook has billions of users so how is it possible that it searches billions of uh, users in a database and it tells you uh, in a nanoseconds you don't even uh, blink your eye and tells you that it's taken uh, so it was using bloom filter because it was based on the high accurate uh, like probability with a very high uh, accuracy and uh, so but there was no uh disadvantage even if it, it is wrong so it will just tell you to choose another name so all those uh, applications uh, where a few false positives are acceptable or the address of the value is not required then the probabilistic data structure is the uh, preferred choice uh, 
So, uh, and it has also been proven that uh, non-cryptographic hash functions, which I will explain next, uh, they are the core components of such structures. So any improvement in the design of uh, these hash functions, they, it can have a, a great effect on the overall system's performance. So hash functions, uh, some of you might be familiar with this. They, uh, they are mathematical functions which takes in a variable length input and it produces a fixed length code. And it has many applications like password validation, file integrity, message integrity, blockchain, searching, and whatnot. So uh, all kind of, uh, so these hash functions can be broadly categorized into two fields, cryptographic hash functions, non-cryptographic hash functions. So all hash functions, they need to confirm to the pro following first four properties, determinism, for the same input, output should be same. Uh, they must be fast. For a single bit change in the input, there should be a large number of changes that is known as avalanche effect. And uniform distribution, the output looks uh, as random as possible. So beside these four properties, uh, the cryptographic hash functions also confirm the properties of collision resistance, pre-image, and second pre-image -pre resistance. So these properties are used to make them cryptographically secure, but also makes them computationally very expensive and also slow. So they are not very suitable for high-speed searching applications, and that's where uh, non-cryptographic uh, hash function comes in. They have a weaker, weaker security guarantees, but uh, they are very fast which is the case uh, in our uh, uh, scenario. So uh, talking about research challenges, uh, um, so these, uh, the flow IDs that I just talked about, so in, if you are doing a real-time detection and monitoring, so these need to be looked up at the line rate. So many large data centers uh, that form the basis of the cloud computing like Amazon, Microsoft Azure, they are increasingly using uh, uh, FPGAs uh, so that to, they, to increase uh, uh, the throughput and uh, decrease the latency and uh, at the low cost. And so therefore, uh, implementing the probabilistic data structure such as Bloom filter sketches on FPGA uh, can have a, a very uh, good impact uh, if you want to achieve high operating frequency, low latency, and high throughputs. And moreover, uh, networks having a bandwidth of 46 terabits per second have become reality. And in future, uh, the, the, the bandwidth will continue to increase. So, uh, so in order to meet the present and the future requirements, so uh, network applica monitoring applications which detect packets at the uh, real time, they should be ready for such high bandwidth. So, but uh, the problem is that the designing a hash function is not an easy task. It's very complex because the relationship between input and output variable is very nonlinear, abstruse, complex, and uh, it involves a lot of nonlinearity. And that's where uh, the evolutionary computation techniques excel. So before going forward, I will just briefly tell you what evolutionary computations are. So these are the uh, family of algorithms which are inspired uh, by the Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, so these collectively, these algorithms are called evolutionary computation. And they have many types, for example, genetic algorithm, genetic programming, Cartesian genetic programming, particle swarm optimization, etc. So all these techniques more or less follow this flow. So what happens is that initially you create a population of solutions. Uh, you also call them, you can also call it as uh, individuals or chromosomes. And so you start with the chaos. So you don't know uh, how they are, how good they are. So you just create it uh, with a large population and you call it generation zero. And then you find some way to measure their fitness. You measure the uh, fitness of each and every chromosome or possible solution. And then you pass it to the step of selection. So selection is where you select which solutions can become uh, parents for the next generation to pass their genes. So the, uh, the solutions or chromosomes which have a, a higher fitness, we will give them more chance to contribute for the next generation. And for the lesser ones, we give them the less chance. So in this way, you generate uh, uh, a new population with the help of these two operators. So with uh, crossover, you, two, you take two different parents and then you swap some parts of uh, uh, them, uh, between them, and then, in, in a, and then you hope that it is better than uh, their parent. And occasionally you also uh, do the mutation, you randomly uh, 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 mutate or change some 
element, for example, like uh, flipping a bit to one to zero and then see how it goes. And then you measure the fitness value again. And the evolutionary process uh, keeps on uh, repeating itself unless you meet the stopping conditions. So what are the stopping conditions? Either uh, you achieve uh, your goal, you achieve a perfect fitness value, or it can be that uh, the number of generations are completed because uh, one of the disadvantage of uh, evolutionary computation is that they require a tremendous amount of computing resources. And so uh, if you are not able to find it in, in certain time, so you need to finish it. And so in the end, you have the uh, uh, set of solutions, not only one, but uh, uh, more than one, which are equally uh, good. So that's uh, a very advantageous situation uh, compared to the conventional uh, algorithms where you have only one solution. So it provides you the different solutions which are equally good. So uh, in our research, so uh, we are focusing on genetic programming. Uh, genetic programming is basically, uh, it represents computer programs with the help of syntax trees. For example, this is a very, very simple digital circuit and this has its uh, tree representation. So GP, uh, uh, why we have chosen uh, GP genetic programming? Because uh, genetic programming employs the same logical operators uh, that are the basic uh, fundamental building blocks of uh, uh, digital circuit, so they are easier to implement and they are also very efficient. So uh, what are the problems with the existing uh, uh, non-cryptographic hash functions, both evolutionary based, non-evolutionary based? So based on our research, uh, majority of uh, non-cryptographic hash function, uh, they are designed for uh, software, uh, to run on software. That's why they are not very uh, efficient when you are, you implement them directly on FPGA. Uh, why? Because most of the um, the non-cryptographic hash function they use uh, they employ a costly multiplication operator, and this multiplication operator is very uh, relatively uh, complex as compared to the other logical operators, and it consumes a lot of resources on hardware, and also it introduces longer delay paths. But it definitely produces a very good entropy. Uh, which is, which me, uh, by entropy I mean the randomness, so, uh, but it is not efficient. On the other hand, uh, many evolutionary computation based techniques also rely on collision rate as a fitness function. Uh, I will tell you next what is fitness function, but for now, the collision rate, like when two elements uh, have produces the same hash value. So you input something into the hash function and it gives you an output. The output we call it hash. So if two different inputs are producing the same hash, so we call it collision. So many of the techniques are based on this collision criteria. So, but this collision criteria is highly depending, dependent on the data set you are using. So it will only work on specific data sets. Secondly, uh, and, and, it is, uh, uh, and it will not work well on the avalanche metrics that I will explain next. So they are not, so evolution, so hash function which are evolved using this criteria, they are not suitable for probabilistic data structures because they also need to have a very good uh, avalanche properties. So uh, moving on, uh, previously uh, in my, in one of my work, so uh, I proposed a 96-bit uh, input-output hardware-friendly non-cryptographic hash function and I, we called it GPNCH. So it, it takes 96-bit input uh, and it produces a 96-bit output. So why you, are, you, you can, uh, you must be wondering why 96 to 96 because mostly in hash functions we see uh, a compression uh, like from 96 to 32 or 16 because in our case the flow ID is 96 so that's why we have used a 96 bit input and the output 96 it can be even larger as well it depends because in the probabilistic data structures it uses multiple hash functions. So in our approach, we, uh, we wanted to produce a large value so that this large value can be divided into small chunks. And these small chunks work as independent hash functions. So for example, for a uh, 4K memory size, uh, so you might need uh, eight hash functions of 12 bits each. So you can divide your 96 bit into uh, uh, 12, 12, 12 bits and you can produce eight hash functions, something like this. So, and we also completely satisfied avalanche metrics and uh, when we compared it to the state of the heart, uh, uh, state of the art hash functions, uh, it was at least 19% 19, 19 better in terms of operating frequency, throughput and latency. But this work, 
uh, it uh, it used the uh, hyperparametric settings and primitive settings. Uh, it took it from the uh, literature review and did not experiment it. What other possibilities are there? So it just produced good results, uh, uh, I would say. And uh, so in uh, this research, our focus is more on uh, how these logical operators play a, a role. Uh, what is the uh, uh, how they interact with each other in various different combinations and and by uh, also we wanted to see uh, uh, experiment with the various kind of hyperparameter settings uh, that are available and so we wanted to see that uh, whether there is any other possibility which which even performs better than that uh, so in the end we also uh, wanted to achieve uh, much higher throughputs and lower latencies so uh, talking about the uh, hash function design criteria. So generally, uh, broadly, uh, hash functions, performance of hash functions are evaluated in terms of uh, either collision resistance, as I just tell, uh, told you, uh, distribution of output, how random they are, and how fast they are, or avalanche effect, like for a single bit change, how many bits in the output are changing. So in our research, uh, uh, basically, uh, we are using avalanche of, uh, effect as a uh, fitness function because why? Because by avalanche, it, uh, um, the, as per the research, uh, we don't, it does not depend on the data set. It is the, uh, uh, it depends on the how good your mixing function, that is your hash function is. So, and secondly, uh, the avalanche metrics uh, proposed by, uh, used by John Damon in one of his works and uh, which are basically three metrics, uh, bit dependence, avalanche weight and entropy. So if these are the most commonly used metrics to uh, evaluate uh, avalanche effect on hash functions, and if these metrics are satisfied, so not only you are satisfying the avalanche properties, but you are also satisfying the uniformity. For example, this uh, bit dependence, it tells, us, tells you that how many bits uh, in the output may flip uh, if you change a single bit in the input. Avalanche weight, it, is the, uh, it tells you that how many, uh, on the average, how many bits are changing uh, in the output in response to single bit change. And this entropy, it measures the randomness of the output. And it, is, uh, it also generalizes uh, strict avalanche criteria. Uh, strict avalanche criteria states that if you flip a single bit in the input, so the probability of each bit being changed in the output should be 50%. So that's very, very strict criteria compared to the avalanche. Uh, this is a general criteria, but this is a strict avalanche criteria. So if you satisfy this entropy criteria, so basically, uh, we, if you have a very high randomness, which means that you are also uh, achieving good uh, random distribution. So in our case, uh, uh, because the input uh, output block size is 96 bits, so in order to fully satisfy this criteria, this value has to be 96. This value has to be 48, and this value has to be 96. So, uh, so if the, if you sum it up, so then it is a 240. So we wanted to get as close as to 240. Uh, okay. So methodology, uh, when you want to start evolutionary process, so you need to define uh, these four things. First, you must have a fitness function. Uh, then you need to create a primitive set. A primitive set basically. Uh, fitness function, I, I told you that it is. it can be any criteria which just tells you that whether your uh, uh, function is good or bad. So it depends on problem to problem. In our case, it was that we wanted to achieve uh, uh, the sum of these three metrics. Uh, the primitive set, it is very important. Basically, it provides you all the genes that your uh, chromosome is made up of. So in our case, uh, it was a combination of uh, logic circuit gates that I will show you next. Uh, stopping condition uh, and then uh, the parameter setting. So first you need to set these things and then you start your uh, simulation. So as I told you before, the fitness function, in our case, it is uh, based on the combination of bit dependence, avalanche weight and entropy. If you sum it up, it is 240. So our goal was to that to get to as close to 240 as possible. But the problem is that you cannot uh, train your algorithm for uh, all possible 96-bit inputs because then it's 2 to the power 96 and it's so much uh, space. So we have used, uh, obviously, uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So we trained uh, our algorithm by doing 2400-bit flips. So we would take a number, then we flip single bit, uh, and then we change how many bits are 
uh, changing in the output. Then we flip the second one and third one up to 96. So we empirically found out that by doing a 2400 bit flips, uh, it is enough to test it on a, a large data set uh, where we flip 2400 million data sets, uh, where, um, uh, bits. So, uh, and all the results that we reported uh, in the paper and in this presentation is based on uh, the large scale testing. So, uh, talking about this primitive set, so here you can see uh, the primitive set. This primitive set is taken from our previous work, uh, GPNCH, that I talked to you before. So, but in this research, we wanted to investigate, for example, what happens if we omit a single end uh, from a circuit, like there is no end in it. And what happens if we replace the end with the R? Or if we remove this not, for example, by this uh, exclusive R. So what happens? So basically uh, there are uh, 127 different uh, possible combinations, even if uh, only for this primitive set. So then uh, as I told you before that evolutionary computation is uh, very expensive uh, to evaluate. So you cannot do all these experiments. Uh, so what we did is that we tried to eliminate redundant uh, combinations. For example, first we omitted a certain set of uh, operators and or not swap exclusive R rotations constants. And then we found out that if, uh, if any operator is significantly degrading uh, the performance of the hash function, so it also performs equally bad in combination with other uh, operators. For example, if you omit exclusive R, so and or you omit exclusive R in combination with the end, so the results are equally bad. So then in this way, you can streamline your testing by uh, eliminating the uh, redundant uh, uh, possibilities. So we tested the following uh, single omissions, some two, uh, two operator omissions and then triple omission. Uh, similarly, for uh, hyperparameter setting, there is a vast, uh, uh, vast uh, settings that you can try. So obviously, uh, you cannot try all the ranges, but in our case, so we found that uh, below certain ranges or above certain ranges, if the results don't improve or the results degrade, so we don't need to go any further. So we tested uh, uh, the what effect of block size, uh, tournament size, crossover rates, uh, and some other things that I will explain next. A uh, few slides. So, and uh, for the terminals, uh, uh, terminals in your in your tree. So, the, so you are the leaf nodes, the last nodes, uh, they, they are called uh, terminals. So basically they provide the entry paths to your circuit. So in our case it was either inputs or it was either constants. Stopping addition was that either perfect fitness is achieved or, uh, or the number of generations are satisfied. For the software we used a Python deep framework uh, which is a very excellent platform. You can try many different uh, algorithms in that. And uh, for the hardware, we, uh, thanks to COSIC, so I used their 96 cores uh, CPU, otherwise my, I would not have been able to achieve these uh, results and it, I think, took two, three months to complete all the experiments, even with this much uh, computations. And for the hardware implementation, we used FPGA chip, uh, Vertex Ultra Scale Plus, and we specifically chose this variant because uh, in the in all of our comparisons, so most of the work uh, in, for the most of the work they use this FPGA chip. So then the comparison makes sense because uh, if the FPGA is a higher end, it can also boost your uh, performance. So results and discussions. So uh, firstly, uh, we investigated that uh, how the uh, the the size of the tree. Uh, grows as the size of your input uh, increases. So, and as you can see that as the size of the block size increases from 16 to uh, input size 16 to 96, so that the maximum number of uh, nodes, the, the tree size refers to the nodes in your tree. So it also increases and roughly it, it has this uh, nonlinear relation of big O notation n to the power 1.5. So why this is important? Because uh, some uh, network monitoring and applic uh, detection applications, they might only uh, require to monitor a source IP, then it's 16-bit, or source IP or destination IP, then it's 32-bit. Uh, or even uh, this also gives us uh, an idea that how much 
uh, the size of the tree would be required if you want to, let's say, uh, go for the detection of flow ID for IP version 6. In that case, the input size is 296 bits. So, uh, uh, yes. For the primitive set variations, uh, as I just discussed, so the outright exclusion of rotation operator uh, significantly degrades the result. So uh, you cannot design a good hash function without having a rotation in it. And uh, similarly, if you omit exclusive R operator, so or in combination with other uh, operators, uh, so the performance is equally bad. So this red line shows that the 240 so if something is near to, to this line, which means it's very good. So you can see this one is way, way below uh, the required fitness values. So this exclusive R and rotation, they are extremely important. As far as the om single omission of uh, other operators like AND, OR, NOT, or some constants, so they, uh, so they d do not significantly degrade the performance, but their presence helps uh, or boost their uh, fitness values to get close to uh, 240. The other thing that we noticed that the, uh, the pair of AND and OR, so if you omit them in pair, so it uh, significantly reduces the fitness and which is far more than their individual removal. And this result is also uh, confirmed by their uh, exclusion with combination with NOT. So, which also makes sense because and or not, you know, with this combination, this is a very uh, lethal combination. It can, you can design any kind of uh, Boolean logic with this. So, if you are, if you don't have any and and or, and especially in combination with not, so then uh, you can, uh, can cannot design so many uh, Boolean functions. So, uh, next. So what is the effect of tournament and population size? So the tournament, basically it's a very interesting concept in evolutionary computation. So you have to have, you have to choose parents as I told you before. So you have good, so you have measured the fitness of every chromosome or every possible solution. And then you need to select some parents from it and you have to give higher probability to the parents which are better. So, so you, there are many other methods as well. So tournament is one of the very uh, famous one because uh, so in, in that, so uh, you, uh, for example, if tournament size is five, so there are five chromosomes, they are competing with each other. So one who wins, he gets a chance to uh, become a parent. So as the tournament size increases, as you can see, so uh, nine to 10, 20 or 30, for example, so the best one, will have an uh, edge over that. So uh, like they will be always selected. But if the tournament size is small, so it gives fair opportunity to even the, some of the lower ones as well uh, to become parent and pass on their uh, uh, genes. And which in, 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 in nature, if you see, uh, also if you keep only the best ones, it's not good for society. You lose diversity. So you need to have a population diversity. That's why you also need to have a bad ones as well. Otherwise, uh, if you only, for example, even there was an experiment to, uh, to have people uh, wed with each other who both are genius. So ultimately, and then their children, and then the children will also wed with each other. And then even evenly, uh, that doesn't work out. So you need to have a bad ones or lesser, uh, fitter, people as well in population. So the same thing applies here. So in our case, so this population, the tournament size uh, uh, of three and five, it produced a very good results, but as the size increases to nine, so the results started to decrease. And uh, uh, yeah, which is because, uh, because the fitter ones were selecting again and again, so we lost uh, diversity. So, uh, so in our, uh, so we found out that this, uh, the sizes of three and five are good for and this kind of problem. For the population size, uh, it, it depends on your uh, problem that you are tackling with. So we started with the population size of 100 and 200. So because as I told you that in even one, hour, one of our uh, simulation, it took four to five days to complete. So we started with the 100 and 200 uh, different kind of uh, uh, solutions. And in those solutions, we had actually this logical gates in, in, in different configurations. So a human cannot even try those possibilities that placing and 
before OR or what happens if you take this OR and place it somewhere else in the circuit. So you had, uh, but this one was not giving satisfying results. So we increased the size and at the size of 300 and 400, we achieved a very good fitness uh, results. So the next is crossover and mutation rate. So crossover, as I told you that, uh, so when you have a two good uh, you have two different parents which are uh, uh, relatively better fitness than the rest of the one. So you take some part from this one and some part from the second parent and then you make a new offspring. And you hope that uh, if uh, it will be better, the child will be better than their parents. So and then this mutation is randomly changing some uh, part of your solution. And in our case, if you have a large tree, so it means that uh, you can take any corner, uh, for example, it has and exclusive or not. So you remove it and you put it and, 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 for example. So it's, it's like that. So, so you need to define the rates for that. So like uh, this crossover is happening with a 90% probability and this mutation, this happens with a 10% probability. So normally uh, the crossover mutation rates, they need, they balance each other. Uh, to provide, uh, to balance the exploitation and exploration. Uh, exploration means that when you are uh, finding out the solution in unexplored space, that's what we call uh, exploration. And exploitation means that when you have a good solution and you try to focus on to improve that good one again and again. So that's why you are exploiting. You already have a good one, you are making it better. Exploration, you are going in the uncharted space. So in order to balance this exploration and exploitation, these rates need to be uh, balanced out with, with the help of each other, with, they complement each other. So far, uh, we found out that we fixed the crossover rate to 0.9 and then we changed mutation rate from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So we found out that uh, here. So as we uh, increase the mutation rate, so the, all of these uh, uh, individuals, they were very good. They were very fit. But the number of generations, uh, initially we started with 2000, but as we were increasing the mutation rate, so the number of generations required were decreasing. So, which is very important because if, uh, if you have more generations, then you require more uh, simulation time uh, to complete. Uh, so, so in that way, you can potentially reduce your software simulation. Uh, uh, next, we have this uh, uh, rotation operator. So basically, we applied a set of circular rotations, which shifted bits in each direction. Um, logically, uh, technically, left and right circular shifts are same. So, uh, so we uh, involved various number of rotations uh, in the in the circuit, and we found a sweet sweet spot when it, we had twenty rotations. Uh, so, and uh, if we increase the rotations or if we decrease, so the results were slightly below the fitness values. And why is that the case? Because if you increase the number of rotations, so then uh, you are sacrificing other vital uh, materials in your uh, design. So, because they are replaced, because uh, you cannot have infinite number of nodes in a circuit. You, so, in our case, we had uh, the maximum capacity of 550. Uh, so because uh, you can even have a bigger trees, but then it's computationally expensive. So if, in, if you keep the size or the number of nodes fixed, like 550 in our case, so then if you increase the number of rotations, uh, in the, in, then they are actually, uh, um, they are taking place in place of other vital uh, operators like AND, exclusive or not. And if you reduce it, so also you're not providing enough genetic material. As far as the swap operator is concerned, so we did not find it very significant, uh, to be honest. So it can be potentially eliminated, but if you uh, want to boost your results, so it obviously helps. So we, uh, we involved uh, various swap operators. We randomly introduced them in, the, uh, in our primitive set. We started with three swaps, then incremented to four, five, six. But as we increased the swaps, so the results were not improving. Uh, more over it, it actually it was decreasing. So this is not a very significant operator, but yeah, it can be there to boost your, uh, to give you a little bit edge. 
As far as the constants are concerned, uh, they are very important. Uh, so they have a paramount sickness in your in a hash function design because not only they uh, they provide you non-linearity and boost your avalanche effect, but also uh, they provide uh, a second inputs. Like you have a main input like flow ID, and then they also act as inputs. So they uh, basically uh, help to achieve uniformity and good avalanche effects. But what number of constants are uh, should be there in the design, that's also very important. So we started with one constant and then we gradually increased the uh, constants and when we had five number of constants in the design, that's where we uh, hit the bullseye. So um, next, uh, lastly, um, the tree height. So the tree height uh, refers to uh, the number of nodes starting from your root node to your leaf node. So in your tree uh, data structure, so you have a one main node where your output goes, uh, comes from, and then uh, you have the leaf nodes at the bottom. So st if you start counting the nodes from your top root node to bottom, that is basically the height of the tree. So this, uh, um, because in Python, uh, you cannot have uh, more than 91, you cannot parse uh, expression with more than 91 nodes. So, uh, so that's why we started with 75 and then we gradually uh, decrease the height to 10. So it has, so it basically we unveiled uh, two distinct phenomena by changing the height. So first is that as you uh, decrease the height, vary the height from 75 to uh, 15. So, um, so many of them were producing uh, good fitness values but one thing that we noticed that the number of generations was decreasing as the as the heights, as the height decreased, the number of generations required, they were also decreasing. And for even this, uh, at the height of 15, so the number of generations were like 900 and it's achieved a very good fitness value. So previously, uh, we were required about around 2000 generations, but now we achieved results in around 900. So, uh, which is very significant because it potentially uh, half the simulation time. So the thing which was running for, uh, like you need to train your hash function. So the things which was taking four days, so now it started to complete in less than two days. And, uh, and but why is that the case? Because we noticed that the, the if you reduce the, uh, if you fix, uh, reduce the tree height, so in that way, uh, we kept the total number of nodes same, 550, but we force it to produce a tree with the smaller branches. It's like you have a tree with the branches, but we force it to have a smaller branches, but keep the total number of nodes to 550. So what happened is that the tree was more bushy. So it had uh, more branches and, and more uh, bushes on it. So the more bushes basically allows you to have more entry points into your tree. Um, like more input can can enter to your circuit from so many other directions as well. Because all these branches uh, on their uh, interface, you have input. It, it can either be your flow ID or it can either be constant. So if you allow more entry pathways, so th th you have a better chance of uh, mixing this value in a much better way. And secondly, uh, a, a very important thing we notice uh, on this x-axis, we have number of nodes. So although we uh, allowed it to have a maximum number of 550 nodes, but as we reduce the uh, uh, tree height, so one of them even achieved uh, the perfect fitness value in around 430 nodes. So uh, previously it was taking 550 nodes, but now it took 430 nodes. And why this is important, uh, the uh, for, for, 430 nodes compared to 550? Because when you implement on the hardware, so then uh, if the circuit is smaller, so not only you have uh, you achieve better performance in computational efficiency, but also um, if any one of you is familiar with the hardware, so they, you know that you also have uh, less uh, routing delay. For example, the signal travels from your input to your output. So if the circuit is smaller, so it is taking less travel time, so it helps. So uh, this was the final uh, design, uh, the best design that we uh, were able to achieve uh, with the help of evolution. It looks very uh, big and uh, strange to you, uh, that, but it represents a very good hash function, non-cryptographic hash function. And if you, uh, it, it, 
it it looks that it has a lot of number of uh, 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 number of nodes and also there you can see there are so many entry points and and some of the inputs are these constants but if you analyze it closely so it has only 432 nodes but out of that 201 are rotations and uh, along with the input so the 75 percent of the nodes that you see in the previous diagram they are either rotation or input so uh, which uh, so rotation is the most efficient operator to implement on the hardware because it's just a rewiring of the signals it adds no uh, computational cost uh, in the hardware as far as uh, the other operators are concerned so they were also used uh, but they were not in uh, large quantity but yeah uh, you can see that the exclusive r was used one zero and seven hundred times so and also we uh, 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 analyzed before that this exclusive r and this rotation they are the most important uh, operators in hash design and and here they are also used in in, in large quantity compared to the other so uh, com if we compare this to our previous uh, design so the number of logical operators there is not big difference in in, in that but the, the 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 major sorry sorry for that so uh, the ma the major improvement is coming from this rotation so here it had 201 and here it has uh, 293 rotations so but uh, then you can ask the question that the rotation is very effective on hardware it's just a rewiring of the signal it incurs no computational cost so how how it was better with the smaller nodes but uh, but the but the fact is that this uh, uh, number of rotation operators if there are more rotation operators so this the delay that we calculate in the hardware uh, is based on two things one is the logical delay and one is the routing delay logical delay basically uh, it's uh, based on your logic how many gates you uh, used in it and how much time it is taking for them to uh, uh, to give you the result and the routing delay is how long it takes your signal to travel from one path to the other path so if there are less number of uh, rotation so then it obviously have effect on the, your right routing delay so it that that's why uh, I will show you in the end that it was comparatively uh, faster on FPGA than this design so uh, where do we stand if we talk about state-of-the-art uh, non cryptographic hash functions as you can see our hash function we call it ehash uh, it choose out uh, each hash value in only 1.5 nanosecond and it only takes one clock cycle on FPGA to complete with no feedback. It's only communitarial uh, logic. And it is achieving a throughput of 61 gigabits per second and achieve operating frequency of 645. And it is using 1542 LUTs. And comparing to the rest of the state of the art, it has improved 8.4% uh, operating frequency and throughput and 7.74% uh, latency. So if these state of the art hash functions, you can see it has this FNV1A, it has this uh, murmur, which are uh, very well known hash functions, non cryptographic hash functions, and they have a very good avalanche and uh, uniformity properties. But uh, if you compare their latency, with our so it's uh, far far better but talking about the uh, other very closely for uh, related work for example this is Zudo or this skinny or uh, spec so they see basically this spec NC for example it stands it uh, so the uh, the authors they have taken a very good hash function and they reduced the uh, number of rounds so that they become suitable for hardware implementation so if so so the best one uh, that we found is this zudo so uh, so the zudo uh, remained resource efficient so it is using 480 480 compared to our which is uh, three times less so it remained by far the resource efficient but as far as the computational speeds and throughputs are concerned so we were uh, able to outclass them so in this uh, research to conclude uh, we highlighted or we reconfirmed that the exclusive R and rotation are the are indeed the most crucial operators in uh, hash function design the presence of other logical operators and constants so 
uh, they are uh, also important if you want to achieve a perfect result. So if you can afford a little bit less perfect result, so they can be omitted. The height of uh, the tree, it has a dual effect. Not only it reduces the overall size of the tree, which makes it faster on software simulation, and you can even uh, reduce the software simulation time by more than half. And uh, also, it helps you to reduce the number of size of the nodes, which makes it faster on FPGA implementation. So the proposed hash function outperforms the state of the art by at least 8.4 and 7.7%. .7%. Uh, for the future work, there are so many uh, directions. For example, we can uh, we have a plan to apply uh, Cartesian genetic programming. It is another very important uh, evolutionary technique in which which represents uh, instead of the tree, it represents as a two-dimensional grid of nodes, which is which more looks like a neural networks. So it also has a very good potential uh, to uh, to even better the results of this genetic programming, the tree approach. Also, we can evaluate, uh, we can half implement on the uh, software and half and uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make things faster in software, we can evaluate our fitness function uh, on uh, FPGA because FPGA uh, gives you advantage of parallelization. So this fitness, uh, as I told you, we have, if we have a population size of 500 and you need to find out how good they are. So you need to calculate their fitness. So their fitness can be calculated in parallel because they're not depending on each other. So, and we did use parallelism in software, but in hardware, FPGA, you cannot match the parallelism of FPGA with a CPU. So you can measure uh, fitness values on FPGA. In this way, you can even explore more hyperparameters. You can test more possible combinations to even produce better results. Or you can uh, completely uh, implement everything from the scratch on FPGA, uh, but it is a very complicated and requires a very high level skills in FPGA, but it will indeed produce uh, good results. Or, um, or you can uh, apply the same technique on uh, IP version 6, in which we have the flow ID size of 296. So it will be very challenging uh, to, uh, to see how much big tree we need and uh, because it's uh, computationally expensive, so it will also be interesting to see that uh, how can we manage it. So thank you, uh, that's all from my side. And if you have any questions, uh, you're more than welcome to ask. <laughs>